while you started, I'm not going to stay on, you know, we're looking at the distinctions, and we'll go through that in a moment. We're looking at the distinctions in our first word, which was dispensation. One of those distinctions is baptism. So we'll talk about that this week and maybe just a short time next week and we're on to the next word. So don't think we're going to camp out here forever on baptism. But, all right, let's look to the Lord in prayer and we'll start on our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your marvelous grace, uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ and all that belongs to us right now because we're joined to him and what is his is ours uh, through that union. We just thank you so much for that. We thank you that you didn't leave us without your word to strengthen us, to edify us, to train us up, uh, and prepare us really for the judgment seat of Christ. We thank you for that. We thank you. I thank you once again for the people here um, to study your word with me. And thank you for all things, and we know you're aware of what's going on in our world, and we know everything is in your control, in your hands. We thank you for that and trust you for it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We, uh, we're going to get started again this morning in our lesson. I call it Waterworks. I don't know why, but... It's about the baptisms, the distinctions. When we come to that very first Bible term, we're not on, we're not to the second one. We will be that second one shortly. But right now we're on the distinctions in dispensation. And as you all know, a dispensation is uh, the manner, the different manners and manner in which God's dealt with man down through time. Um, so we're looking at the distinctions in the dispensations, and more particularly, the distinctions in the law of dispensation from the grace dispensation. And there's some notable distinctions because you know what fusion is and you know what mixing is, especially the ladies. You can, some things will mix, but they'll never fuse. Oil and water is a great example. You put all the water together and you can shake it up so they look like they're one substance, but what happens when you set it down the table? Separate. Fusion is when two things go together and law teaching and grace teaching you might mix them all you want, but they'll never fuse because uh, they don't go together. So the first term again was dispensation. And uh, we're looking at some things that were true for the law of dispensation, not true for the dispensation of the grace of God. We know that the things that were true for the law nation were true for Israel while the law of dispensation was in place. And that's changed. So, um, you know, the law contract called for them to obey that law both faithfully and consistently. They couldn't break one point or they'd just broken the whole contract. And Israel failed to do what the fathers of Israel told God they were capable of doing. So what did God do? Did he do away with that nation that he promised to make a baby? Did he do away with the promises he made to that nation? Not at all. That's all on hold. He didn't do away with it. He simply put those promises on hold for a time yet undisclosed. We don't know when uh, he's going to begin dealing with Israel or looking at them in a national perspective. But he's going to fulfill the plan that he uh, has in mind for them in the future. And they have a great, they, they'll have a great role to play in the future when God restores them. Uh, and that will be during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. God then began dealing differently with his entire human creation. Even the Jews that were part of that Israel program even those people, because it was not about what they were to do, it's what, how God was dealing differently with everyone when the dispensation changed. Uh, since the Gentiles were unable to come to God through Israel, which they will one day, uh, enjoying the blessings that would overflow Israel's table as they merited those blessings, and, or had she merited those blessings, God put that on hold. The Gentiles were never able to enjoy the blessings that overflowed Israel's table because no blessings did. She merited all the cursings of Leviticus 26, and I think Schofield calls it chastisements. So Israel had all those chastisements coming. Um, and so this is why we began looking at the Bible term, which must be understood if we're going to understand our Bible properly. And there are distinctions, as I said earlier, in the way that God dealt with Israel under the law and the way in which he's dealing with all men today during the dispensation of the grace of God. I'm using, I'll always use the term men generically. It's men and women. And we're talking about mankind. These distinctions in the dispensation of the law, in the dispensation of grace, must be understood, as I said, lest we become confused as to what God's doing today, how he's doing it, and what he tends to accomplish through it. Uh, not understanding these distinctions in the two major dispensations has resulted in the multitude of denominations in the religious world today. I think the book is some two inches or three inches thick. One of those major distinctions, as I said, is that it has to do with that term baptism. That's the distinction we're presently studying. 
Israel, under the law dispensation, had numerous ceremonial washings called washings in the uh, what's called the Old Testament and baptisms in what's called the New Testament. Um, and then she invented some of her own. <laughs> the religious people invented some baptisms of their own. And we saw that it wasn't that God said, well, that's all right, you're doing it for me, we'll let it go. God was very displeased in what they were doing because they were, reject were rejecting what he told them to do and doing what they felt would make them a rung up spiritually speaking uh, on the ladder. But they didn't please God in the least. He called them tr the tradition of men. Let me show you two verses, one referring to the time of the law contract as Christ's words were recorded in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, and the other written during the dispensation of grace by the Apostle Paul. Both have to do with Israel's invented, her own devised baptisms. We'll read them side by side. Mark chapter 7, verse 8. We'll begin with that one. And then we'll look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing, now that word washing is baptismos, also translated baptisms in Scripture, as the baptisms of pots and cups and many other such things like you do. They had invented their own spiritual religious practices. These were ceremonial washings or baptisms, and in this case they were never intended by God, but designed and practiced by religious men such that religious ritual uh, became tradition passed down from generation to generation with a a self-assumed holiness attached to them. Uh, God was telling them that there was nothing holy about those things. Now for Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, where the apostle of the Gentiles is speaking to believers today during this dispensation of the grace of God. Here Paul says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Uh, in other words, the way, man think, the way men think things ought to be, philosophy. In vain deceit, uh, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments, meaning the fundamental arrangements of the world and not after Christ. So the world has some fundamental arrangements. They had them in Paul's day, we have them in ours. These invented baptisms in Christ's day were man-made religious arrangements while the law program was still in place and not the baptisms that God had given to Israel. Now here in Colossians 2.8, the Apostle Paul is acknowledging that fundamental religious practices invented by man continue to exist in the religious world during the present dispensation. And of course, that, that would cover the practice of any rites or any rituals of the law contract by, uh, by which God was operating with Israel. Whether they be practiced as God intended them for Israel, or whether they were altered today in a manner to keep things in place that were in place for Israel, but in a different form. Uh, whatever it is, uh, that's traditions of men, Paul said. God was never pleased with it. Uh, the saints in Galatia had fallen for the false notion that adding law to grace would somehow perfect those saints in their salvation, if not enhance their spirituality. They were bringing something from the law dispensation into the grace dispensation. I like William McDonald's statement. Let me quote him here. McDonald said, If they, the Galatians, could not obtain salvation by works, could they expect to grow in holiness or Christian maturity by the law? Not at all. Uh, if the power of the Spirit was necessary to save them, could they complete, if not enhance, the process themselves by fleshly efforts? Great statement. This is precisely why Paul called them, starts with F, what they call them. Foolish. <laughs> These Galatians were beginning to believe that they needed to submit themselves to a Jewish ceremonial practice called circumcision, thinking it enhanced their spirituality, if not accomplishing their very salvation. No wonder Paul called them foolish. foolish. Can you not hear the Judaizers, though, speaking to those saints in Galatia? It's a necessary act of obedience. It's a wonderful expression of your faith. What the Judaizers were calling faithfulness, God and Paul were both calling foolishness. Uh, yet, in spite of Paul's rebuke of the Galatians, isn't it interesting that people today are still hanging on to the idea that they can somehow lift themselves up or run higher on the ladder, so to speak, of spirituality by submitting themselves to another of Israel's law requirements, namely ceremonial washing. Um, only today, in an altered form, it's called believer's baptism. Uh, is it going to make a same person lost? No way. It's going to make them wet, but not lost. Uh, should we denounce them for it? Should the first thing out of our mouths be believe, do you believe in water baptism? Not at all. Not at all. We'll never reach somebody that way. Um, and that's not a hill to die on, really. The gospel is the only hill 
to die on as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we can sure help if we're asked for help. Um, but to be adamant and, and denounce people for, for something that's not going to send them to hell, uh, they just need to learn, like I need to learn. Uh, so today it's called believer's baptism. God didn't replace circumcision, as many teachers said, would proclaim, with baptism, uh, as some suggest. Modern-day religionists have done that very thing. Nearly every religious group in existence today practices baptism in some form or fashion. Did you know that? The question is not if, but how they do it. Now, for instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jehovah is the correct name for God and that Jehovah is the father of Jesus, who was originally the Archangel Michael. Jehovah also being the father of Satan in their view. They celebrate no uh, quote unquote Christian holidays or birthday celebrations. Uh, they're taboo, but they do celebrate the Passover supper in the Jewish tradition by a Seder. Baptism, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, that doctrine is by full immersion. When the newly baptized participant returns from immersion, he or she is believed to have com a completely clean conscience and a blank sin slate from which they can begin to grow or, new, or begin anew. Uh, they deny the Trinity. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit. They deny Jesus' physical resurrection. They deny salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and the all-sufficient crossword accomplishment of Christ alone. Yet they believe in water baptism for a fresh new start and a clean sense of life. Isn't that interesting? Mormons believe that keeping God's commandments is imperative. Listen to this. I'm quoting from an article entitled, Why Baptism for the Dead? Many people have died without receiving baptism and other ordinances that Jesus Christ taught were necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And they list John 3, 5. Because Heavenly Father wants all His children to have the opportunity to return to Him, He has provided a way for those who have died without these ordinances to receive them. How can they do that? Well, the article goes on to tell us that members of the Mormon Church can perform these ordinances on behalf of their ancestors who have already died. Uh, this makes it possible for those who have not received these ordinances to accept them in the spirit world if they so choose and return to live one day with Heavenly Father, they say. Um, baptisms for the dead, and I'm still quoting here, baptisms for the dead are performed by worthy Latter-day Saints ages 12 and up in sacred buildings called temples. But you can see baptisms practice, can't you? Is anyone here familiar with Shintoism? Shinto? Shinto is the native religion of Japan, by the way. Uh, of course, Buddhism was introduced from China in the mid-sixth century, so Shinto became, it really became to be overshadowed by Buddhism. Uh, it's a conglomeration of Japan today. But Shinto is a polytheistic religion. Poly meaning many, theistic meaning God, many gods, which means the venerating of almost any natural object as a god, ranging from mountains, rivers, water, rocks, trees, to dead notables. In other words, it's based on what's called animism, which is attributing a soul to an inanimate object. Um, those of the Shinto persuasion believe that natural wonders are created by the mighty supernatural powers, and that the ghost of the de a deity dwells in such objects. Sounds like the God spark within a modern day pantheism, is it not? We're all God. The God spark is in everybody. Uh, thus, anything, even the rotten head of a sardine, can be deified. So goes the cynical saying. Among the natural phenomena, the sun is the most appealing to these folks. That's that's uh, S U N. <laughs> so the sun goddess is regarded as the principal deity of Shinto. The Japanese national flag, by the way, is simple. Does anybody know what it is? Uh -huh. so, yes, yeah. one red disc in the center. And that disc is to symbolize the sun, or we might say the sun god to the Japanese. But here's an interesting side note about Shinto. There are many abortions performed in Japan, just as there are multitude abortions performed in the United States. According to one source, after these babies are aborted, a Shinto priest goes in and baptizes. Not baptism for the dead in this case, but baptism of the dead. Uh, the point of all this, regardless of the purpose for which it's performed and how it's practiced, baptism is one of the hallmarks of what I call religion done. Uh, take away baptism, the ceremonial water rite and religion of the day where baptisms are counted and celebrated today. 
We baptized 116 last week in the whatever. And you've taken away the heart of many belief systems. Uh, how about baptism from the Bible's perspective, from God's point of view? Well, we've talked about this at some length in previous lessons. According to the Word of God, baptism was a work of faith for the people of Israel. God's plan for the nation he promised to make of Abram was and remains for that matter that Israel is to become a kingdom of priests, priests in the earth. Baptism, in accordance with the law, was the ceremonial washing required for initiation into the priesthood. So baptism was God's water work, in a manner of speaking, uh, for the people of that nation. Is baptism scriptural? You bet it is. Certainly it is. But we need to understand that baptism is also dispensational. Uh, while there are many baptisms in scripture, there are at least 12, and next week I'll give you a listing of all 12. Um, not all baptisms are the same baptism in the Word of God, and not all baptisms included water, which surprises many people. Believe it or not, when it comes to the practice of baptism in current day religion, though, another coined expression, there are far fewer questions about the why part than there are about the how part. Um, the why part is either regeneration or symbolism. Those two things. They either think it regenerates you, you say through it, or it just symbolizes something. The why part. Regeneration symbolism. But both of which are valid arguments for practicing a ceremonial washing rite uh, right today to the people who believe these things. But the how part's even more confusing to those who insist upon practicing a Jewish ceremonial work of faith than the why. People argue over the right way to do it. We've talked about some of this. Shall we sprinkle? Or shall we pour the water over the people? Or shall we fully submerge them in a tank of water? And the debate extends well beyond that. Shall we submerge them forward or shall we submerge them backwards? And it doesn't end there. Should we submerge them once or three times? And is there specific wording we're to use during the baptismal ceremony? And if that isn't enough, there's one group who claims that a tank isn't good enough. You have to be baptized in running water, such as a river. Every group refusing to accept the baptismal rites of the other groups. Uh, once again, what does scripture have to say? When it comes to Israel's ceremonial washings, what was the proper mode? You see, baptism in the Jewish law program was for a reason, and it was to be conducted in a particular manner. Let's refresh our minds. I'm going to read from the very beginning of Numbers chapter 19, and we'll follow the text on down through verse 21. Keep in mind that the word translated washings in the Hebrew is translated baptisms in the Greek. Hebrews 9.10 is our proof text. Now, in Numbers chapter 19, and the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yet. If you recall the ordinance of the red heifer. Verse 3 and 4. And ye shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp. One shall slay her before his face. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger, sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. Verses 5 and 6. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, the priest's sight, her skin and her flesh and her blood. With her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Was that a ritual or not? Wow. <laughs> now watch for the washings or baptisms coming up. Verses 7 and 8. Then the priest shall wash his clothes. That's not translated baptism there. He shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burneth her, that heifer, shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and shall be unclean until the evening. Now neither of those words are translated baptism. Scripture. Verse 9. And the man is, that is clean, physically clean from dirt that is, <laughs> shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a, notice it, pure baptized, shall we say, as he was dealing under the law contract, the Jews under the law contract. So there we have a couple of physical washings. Before we get to the baptismal ceremonial washing, uh, which is coming up in the, with these ashes here, verse 10. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be ceremonially unclean until the evening. Evening, And it shall be unto the children of Israel and unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statute of hell forever. forever. Verses 11 and 12. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. 
he shall purify himself with it on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day, day he shall not be clean. Verse 13. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead, and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of separation is not, next word, sprinkled, sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. Now let's read a bit further on down. Pick it up at verse 16. And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person they shall take the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin, and running water shall be put there to in a vessel. Don't forget, Israel's ceremonial washings in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit calls baptisms when we get to the Greek. Let's watch once again for the mode of baptism that was to be practiced. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and dip, dunk, pour, or sprinkle. Sprinkle. And sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touched a bone or one slain or one dead or a grave. Now are we sure the proper mode was sprinkled? Let's continue verse 19. And a clean person shall dip, dunk, pour, or sprinkle. Sprinkle. sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and he shall be clean at evening. Uh, two additional verses should be enough to set the concrete here. But the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. Now, remember that to the Jews, and this is just a side note, the Gentiles were unclean. So when God separated a, the human race into two parts, circumcision and the uncircumcision, they never had anything to do with each other, or they weren't supposed to, and there was no peace between them. And the law had itself had established that division because the law is what separated the clean from the unclean. You weren't clean if you were a Gentile to a Jew. That's why they weren't to eat with you or travel with you or touch you. You weren't clean. And that's why when the Syrophoenician lady asked Jesus to Christ to cast the demon out of her daughter, he wouldn't look at her. He looked at, looked at his disciples and said, it's not appropriate. Not fitting for me to give the cast the bread that belongs to the children, the children of Israel, to the dogs. They were unclean during that program. He wasn't being mean-spirited. He was just saying how it was at that point in time. Uh, verse 20. But the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from one congregation because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him who is unclean. Find the verse 21. And it shall be a perpetual statute unto them that he that sprinkleth the water of separation shall wash his clothes and he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean until he may. Interesting that this law ordinance is called a water of separation of purification from sins. Not, could the Holy Spirit have made any clear? Anyone still doubting the washing or baptism, baptizing mode for Israel was always by sprinkling, never by dunking. Um, sprinkling was the baptizing method of God's choice when it came to Israel's water of separation or purification from sin. When John came along to make Christ manifest or known to Israel, calling upon the Israelites to be baptized for the remission of their sins, what method do you suppose John used? Do you suppose he used dipping, dunking, pouring, or sprinkling? Is that interesting? Once again, the baptizing ritual performed upon individuals under the law of Moses was always by sprinkling. It was a purification from sin. John said his baptism was for the remission of sins. Now, can we corroborate that idea with other scripture? I believe we can. How about this? When Israel had failed in what she had promised, and what was that again? What did, Israel, what did they say at Mount Sinai? What was their promise? Here it is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. They lied when they said this, told this promise according to Hosea. Deuteronomy 6.25 And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as He hath commanded us. Of course, based upon performance, Israel failed to pass the righteousness test. She boastfully agreed that faithfully, she would faithfully observe so rather than blessings, they merited what I call the cursings. Um, 
King James Version has it, chastisement. Same thing of Leviticus chapter 26. If you're familiar with Leviticus 26.40, you know that God would offer Israel an opportunity to come clean from her adulterous idol worship. You see, Israel had been guilty of idolatry throughout her history under the law contract. What would they need to do to come clean? They need the water of purification, purification for, uh, separation and purification from sin. If they shall confess their iniquity, is the way it's recorded in Leviticus chapter 26, beginning with verse 40. If they shall confess their iniquity. Um, wow. God would offer Israel the opportunity to repent, to change their minds about how faithful they'd actually been under the contract. Uh, then verse 42, God said, Then and only then, if she confessed she'd been unfaithful as a nation, he would remember his covenant with Jacob, his covenant with Isaac, and his covenant with Abraham, and he would then remember not only Israel nationally, but the land that he had given them to that nation. Have they made a national confession, their national leadership, confessing we never kept the law of Moses? And our forefathers were we were able to do it. So has God remembered the land? So don't fall for the 1948 toy. Wow, they begin going into the land. Jews begin going into the land. Unbelieving Jews, unfortunately, for the very majority. Israel could ultimately obtain her promised land, God himself cleansing the land. But only if they change their minds. Repentance is a change of thinking about their ability to do all the commandments that they had promised they were capable of doing. We now know when that repentance opportunity was offered to the nation. We know when it came about. John is the one that God sent to offer that. But what was Israel's response to God's offer through John? Here it is in Luke chapter 7, verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of John. Tell me, do you suppose this is going to stop God from fulfilling his land promise to a national believing Israel in time future? Uh, not a chance. Some did submit to John's baptism, but not the nation as a whole, and certainly not the priesthood leadership of that nation. Notice Ezekiel's prophetic statement about a believing nation in Israel in time future. It was recorded in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 21 through 25. Ezekiel 36. 21 and 22 to begin with it. I should allow some time for you to flip through uh, your Bible and catch these because I want you to continue using your Bible even though I put the verses up on the board. Um, you get out of the habit of using your Bible. And if nothing else, mark the addresses down and look them up for you. Ezekiel 36, 21 and 22. Here God says, But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the Gentiles. Same word. Wherever they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the Gentiles, the heathen, wherever you went. Verse 23. I will sanctify my great name, which is profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. How's God going to accomplish the nation's sanctification? Watch verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Just like that. He's going to give them their land? Not yet. <laughs> Not until they are cleansed. <laughs> what was the mode of Israel's cleansing once again? Sprinkling. Pay attention here to verse 25. Then will I dump, dip, pour, sprinkle. <laughs> then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. This is going to be a spiritual sprinkling in time future when Israel gets her land. Of course, this will be, as I said, spiritual in nature, and it's going to take place for the, na for the nation of Israel in time future. Anyone still thinking that Israel's mode of ceremonial washing came other than sprinkling has had their minds waterlogged in religion. <laughs> That's the way to put it. Uh, let's just throw in one more for the purpose of providing a dry towel for the numbers here. Here is another of Israel's prophets, Isaiah, in chapter 52, verses 14 and 15. Isaiah 52, 13 and 4. Now, got there. Behold, my servant shall do the prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Do you know who that's talking about? As many were astonished at him, or at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man in his form more than the sons of man. Who do you suppose this is talking about here? Christ. Jesus Christ, sure. 
and his death at Calvary, his form marred more than the sons of men. It wasn't a, a fair-headed uh, Caucasian guy with long flowing blonde locks up on a cross with some blood sprinkling around his face. Um, his visage was marred more than any man. Can you imagine? You wouldn't know who Christ was or who he had been by what they had done to him when he was hanging on that, on that cross of Calvary. Uh, but notice the prophetic passage in the very next verse, verse 15. So shall he, did God pour sprinkle? Sprinkle? So shall Christ sprinkle many nations. Uh, does this not sound to you like go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned? Certainly it does. Of course it does. We explain in the Ezekiel passage, Israel rejected her king and his mode of cleansing them. Um, but as we asked earlier, has God forgotten Israel together, altogether? We know not. The answer is no, uh, as prophetically stated in the rest of the verse. You see, at his first coming, many were indeed astonished to the extent of his suffering, his faith. Thanks the Bible says his body were marred beyond recognition as a man. But when he comes again, his second coming, all the way down to the earth, men will be astonished at the magnificence of his glory. Uh, as one commentator puts it, Gentile kings will be speechless when they see his unheard of splendor. Uh, the king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Wow. Yes, indeed, God will sprinkle many nations in that day as Gentiles come to the brightness of Israel's rising, according to prophecy concerning that nation. And how will Israel, God's kingdom of priests, conduct the ceremonial washing or baptisms in that day? I hope at this point we don't say, we're going to dunk them. <laughs> how do we answer those who dunk? Well, and why do they dunk? Before we can begin to answer that, let me insert a comment here that I mentioned in our previous study. Do we who rightly divide the word of truth believe in baptism today? Yes. You should say, yes, we do. However, the baptism we believe in is the baptism performed by the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit identifies every believer at the point of that person's belief with the person of the Savior. That was God's plan for his entire household faith. A spiritual uniting of all believers with the Savior was the secret that God had been keeping from the fact before the foundation of the world uh, and that he revealed to the Apostle Paul to make known to how many men? Oh, and that would have included those Jews, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest, those he spoke with at the Jerusalem Council. And God was his chosen spokesman to reveal this truth. Listen to the Apostle of the New Dispensation. This would be the Apostle Paul. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, where he tells us that Christ sent him not to do something. You see, our baptism today, some folks call it a dry clean. <laughs> By placing believers into the person of the risen and Savior, believers are fully whelmed, keep that expression in mind, fully whelmed uh, with the righteousness belonging to Christ Himself. We'll be talking about being fully whelmed in just a bit. But first notice what Paul tells, uh, what Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, not by a pope, a priest, a pastor, not by any representative of any denomination or religious organization, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. This baptism, as you know, has nothing at all to do with water. This baptism is about immersion into a person. Now, with all the ceremonial baptisms, especially the purification from sin baptism, that was a part of Israel's law program, what does God want believers to know about baptism in this present dispensation? Of all the baptisms related to the law program, how many baptisms does God recognize today? One. Read it with me. The Apostle Paul proclaimed it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. How many baptisms does God recognize today? One, one Lord, one faith. How many baptisms? One, one. one baptism. Now with that said, one of the arguments for a water ceremony today with the mode of that ceremony being toe immersion as many of our denominational friends customarily practice the water rite. Let's take a quick look at John's baptism to see if we can gain a little more insight. We find it in a verse we took note of earlier, John chapter 1 verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of a change of thinking for 
purification from sin, for the remission of, remission of sins. We're told that the word baptize in the Bible means to dip. That's what many scholars say. So if it means to dip, some would say, let's dip people. How about that? But does baptize mean to dip? Very interesting. Interestingly, it does not. Uh, the Greeks did have a word for dipping, but it wasn't the word baptizo, baptize. It was the word bapto. Sounds pretty much like it, doesn't it? But there's a distinction we need to recognize. Uh, definite distinction. As we said before, Greek is a very illustrative language. Just like when it came to love, they had four different words used for love. They, uh, they illustrate what they want to say uh, much more conclusive than we do in English. Um, but I know you're familiar with the parable of Rich Man and Lazarus. Who's heard that? Sure. Uh, so let me show you the difference in bapto and baptizo, one to dip, one to actually baptize. Let's take a quick look. We find it in Luke chapter 16, verse 24. And he, the rich man in Hades, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may bapto, dip. Not baptize, not baptizo, but bapto, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now think about it for a moment. What does dip mean? Because we're told it means to dunk. Uh, it means you take a portion of whatever it is you're dipping, in this case a finger, and you take that portion back out of whatever you dip it into. Does that make sense? Did the rich man ask that Lazarus dunk his entire water, body in water in order to touch his tongue? Or did the rich man say, dip his finger in water? See the difference? There's a difference in dipping and dunking. The word dip in Luke 16 is not baptizo, it's bapto, a different word. The Greeks understood the difference, folks. It's technically incorrect to say that the word baptize, such as what John the Baptist was doing, means to dip in the sense of dunk, because the Greeks had a more specific word for that. There's another reference I'll show you very quickly. Look with me at John chapter 13, verse 26. To set the stage, Jesus was with, was with his disciples here at the Last Supper when this dipping back to took place. John 13, 26. Let's take a quick look. Jesus answered, He it is, because somebody's going to betray Jesus Christ on that evening, or later on that evening. Who would it be? He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have baptized, when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Did Christ Jesus place the entire piece of bread in the cup and wait for it to get soggy? Mm -hmm. Then pull it out? Or did he dip a portion of the bread he was holding into the cup? Had the entire piece of bread been totally immersed, it would have been a whole lot more difficult to offer to Judas. Or anybody, for that matter. Christ could have dipped the bread into wine without ever getting his fingers wet. That's bapto, not baptizo. Just as Lazarus could dip his finger in the water without getting his entire body wet. You see the difference? Technically, baptizo, what John was doing, does not mean to simply dip, get a portion wet. It means to fully whelm. Does that mean to immerse? No, not necessarily. You're going to see what fully well actually means in our second study. This is an important distinction that we need to understand, and we'll be talking about it more fully in our next lesson. Additionally, to fully well does not necessarily have anything at all to do with water. We'll be talking about it, as I said a little later. Just know that the idea behind the word bapto, to dip, is often used to validate an entire dunking of the body in water today as the common ceremonial practice of baptism is performed in many fundamental religious circles in our day. And for that matter, does the word baptism mean a total immersion into water? These are some interesting things to know, folks, and Scripture explains them, and we're going to start looking at that in our next study. We'll end, it, we'll end the lesson here so that we end it on time. We'll pick it up right here in the next lesson. People are immersed today and where they, that comes from. Did John fully immerse Jesus Christ into water? Good question. Was Christ totally submerged when he dipped him? Stay with us. We continue to take a look at the book, and we'll do that in our very next lesson. Uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed and take a little brief, a little refreshment before coming back at uh, a quarter to 11. 10.30. 10 30, all right. Okay. Uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your marvelous, matchless grace. 
We thank you that you do only all the saving and we do only all the believing and being saved. We thank you that um, you're so wonderful that your plan, ingenious plan, called for uh, you to righteousify us, to make us as holy as you yourself in a judicial sense by simply being joined to your son and having what belongs to him now belongs to us. Belong to us. We thank you so much for that. We thank you that as we really study your word, not a cursory reading, but study it, we can grow. We can learn about these things, not to harangue people, not to confront people, um, but so that we might be stabilized in the doctrine and not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We thank you for that. Once again, I thank you for the folks who've come out today to study your word with me. We thank you for all things. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.